So great to see you all this morning here, all the bright and chipper faces, rested from an extra hour of sleep this morning. Isn't that nice? Feels great. Well, I have a kid, so I wouldn't know what that's like, but, you know, some of you probably can agree. But anyway, it's uh, so great just to be here with you all this morning. Uh, We are continuing in our series called Endgame, and we're nearing the end of the book of Revelation. And we're really taking a look at through this series of what is going to happen in the end times of the earth according to Revelation. And if you're joining us for the first time this morning in person or maybe watching for the first time online, I just want to welcome you and just kind of clue you into where we've been to make sure that we understand fully what we're going to be looking at today. We started with this amazing timeline, taking a look all the way back at the very beginning of Revelation. Before we even started into chapter one, we talked about how this is a book of prophecy. Prophecy is pretty much, it's a foretelling of events that are going to happen. And it can be very frightening as we work our way through Revelation to read some of these things that are actually going to happen on the earth. And it might instill some feelings of fear inside of us. But prophecy was written not to instill fear, but to give us hope, to inspire faith in our lives, that we as believers, that we as Christians, we won't have to go through all of this stuff we're about to read because we'll be with Jesus, because we believe and we have that power and that gift in his name. And so we had that as the foundation before we even started looking at Revelation. Then we spent some time in chapters one through three looking at what God has to say to the churches and how they're supposed to get their lives or how we are supposed to prepare ourselves for the return of Christ and what that actually looks like. Then in chapters four and five, we saw this rapture and this amazing scene of heaven and what heaven actually looks like and how it's going to be this glorious place with no pain, no sorrow, no hurt, and true freedom and joy that we all long to be a part of. And then we transition into some dark stuff. We talked several weeks over the tribulation period, the seven-year period on the earth where all kinds of unspeakable, horrible things happen from locusts and diseases and plagues and war and famine and just these really rough events. But even in the midst of it, in chapter 14, there was some hope given to us. We saw this scene of the 144,000 in heaven praising God for giving his people a second chance another chance to receive him and to be spared from the horrible things are going to happen. Again and again and again, we see this theme of God as he's giving us opportunities to grab a hold of him before it's too late. And then last week, Pastor Micah shared with us probably some of the darkest chapters in the book of Revelation. Some really horrible stuff of chaos and grief that took place. But that leads us to where we are today. And we're going to cover this big span today, highlighted in red, from Jesus' second coming to the thousand-year reign, the lake of fire, and the great throne of judgment. All this happens in two chapters, but it's a lot, and it's some really amazing things once we start to look at it. But before we jump into chapter 19 this morning, if you have your Bibles, I just encourage you to open them to Revelation chapter 19 and 20. That's where we're going to be focusing our time this morning. But before we get there, it's important for us to kind of set the stage real quick. See, when Revelation, the manuscript of Revelation was originally written, there were no chapters. There were no verse delineations. It was just one writing. And if we're really going to understand the significance and the power that exists in chapter 19, we've got to hold it up and look at it against chapter 18. And when we do this, what we realize is that it's really just opposite sides of the same coin. Take a look at this. In chapter 18, we learn about the fallen. Chapter 19, those who are risen. Chapter 18 is all about the harlot of Babylon, and chapter 19 is about the bride of Christ. Chapter 18 is about judgment and condemnation. Chapter 19 is about salvation and rejoicing. Chapter 18 is a time of mourning. Chapter 19 is a time of celebrating. You see, chapter 18 is really this earthly perspective where all of mankind is realizing that placing our hope in things of this world, it's only going to lead to death. That's it. That's the end of the story. 
verses chapter 19 says, for those who believe in the Lord and call upon his name, there is true celebration and freedom and rejoicing that will take place in the end times for those who believe in Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of chapter 19 and not part of chapter 18. So with that in mind, let's take a look at chapter 19, starting in verses one through three this morning. It says, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again, they shouted, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. This is a very amazing passage, a great way to open with these shouts of hallelujah. What we see happening right here is it contains this famous hallelujah chorus where all this great multitude of people have gathered together and they're praising God for what he has done and what he is about to do. And what's interesting is that this word hallelujah, it's really a combination of two words. It's hallel, which means praise, and yah, which is short for Yahovah. So it literally means praise be to God. And when you look it up, and I encourage you to go home and, and to challenge me on this, I want you to go home and look it up for yourself. But in the New Testament, this word hallelujah only appears right here in the book of Revelation. Some of you are like, whoa, no way, right? Like we read all the gospels and all these other books. There's no way that that could be true. Look it up for yourself. Hallelujah only appears in the New Testament four times over the span of six verses in Revelation chapter 19. And it's an important thing when we see it happening. We see the saints giving praise to God for creation. The saints giving praise to God for redemption. See, saints giving praise to God for salvation. And now the saints are going to be praising God for what's about to happen to Babylon. What he's about to do upon the earth to call the rest of his believers to be together in this time of celebration. And it's going to be a time of celebration because this is what all of mankind has waited for. This is the marriage of the bride of Christ, Jesus Folks, this is the pinnacle. This is the apex. This is the climax of scripture. This is the return of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. This is such a powerful passage and that's why it's bolded. That's why we see it again and again. And this word is kind of held in reverence for this event. Hallelujah. Praise to God that he sends his son back. That he has brought us into himself. And he's going to bring Jesus back kind of where it all began. You know, if you've ever read the Bible or maybe if you're new to the faith and you just go to church on Christmas and you hear those Christmas stories, you know that Jesus was born in this little town called Nazareth. This little town in Galilee called Nazareth. But how many of us have ever wondered what he saw every day? I mean, as a kid growing up, you know, he probably was able to have fun out in the yard and play, but have we ever really looked at his view? We've seen pictures of stables and of mangers and places where he could have been born and what that would have looked like, but what did Jesus see every single day? Well, it probably looked a little bit like this, just less modernized. This is the Valley of Armageddon. It's a 375 mile valley that sits at the bottom of Galilee. And this is what Jesus got to see every single day. And I just imagine him as a kid sitting and playing and looking out over this valley and just imagining all kinds of things that would happen here. But somewhere deep down, he knew that one day there would be a great battle in this valley. A battle that only he could stop a battle that only he could come and interrupt and finish. And this is what happens when we enter into chapter 19, verse 11, John sees this vision of this moment of Jesus returning to the earth on a white horse to come and interrupt this battle called Armageddon. Take a look at what it says here in chapter 19, verses 11 through 15. He says, I saw heaven standing open, 
And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows, but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Wow. Hallelujah. What a great passage that is. See, there's five things that we need to know about the return of Jesus Christ. The first is this, is that it's anticipated by prophecy. The return of Christ has been anticipated by prophecy. What that really means is that Jesus is the star, the center stage of all of the biblical prophecy writings. It's what all of the prophets have written about more than anyone or anything else in all of their writings. In fact, did you know, next to faith, the second coming of Christ is the second most talked about topic in the entire Bible? I looked it up and I did the math. Take a look at these numbers. The second coming of Christ is mentioned 1,845 times in scripture. 1,527 are in the Old Testament, 318 in the New Testament. That means one out of every 30 verses in the Bible alludes to or deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself mentions it 21 times. Over 50 times in scripture, we are told to get ready to prepare for the return of Christ. Why is this so important? Why is this mentioned so much in scripture? Well, I'll tell you why. This is the conclusion of redemptive history. This is it. This is the end of everything that we see happening here. And it's going to be this amazing place that takes place, this amazing scene that's going on here. And this is what everybody has been waiting for. We've been waiting our whole lives for this moment to happen. The Jews have been longing and looking forward for years for Jesus to return, and it's finally going to happen. Or he's going to come back and establish his kingdom upon the earth. The prophets have written about one who would come down from heaven, would dethrone the Antichrist to establish his own kingdom and his own rule upon the earth. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus told his disciples to pray about. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? How does it open? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Folks, chapter 19 is the answer to that prayer. That gives me shivers. That gives me goosebumps when I think about that. This is prophecy. This is scripture being fulfilled in front of our very eyes. Hallelujah. That's something to celebrate. That's something to rejoice over that we see this taking place right before our very eyes. And we know that it's this prophecy, but we also know the second thing is that when Jesus returns, it's going to interrupt hostility upon the earth. It's going to interrupt hostility. He's going to be coming and putting a stop to this war that is taking place upon the earth. And this is a very different image of Jesus than we've read so far in Revelation. We've seen him as the slain lamb, the peaceful one offering second chances. We see him as this gospel Jesus who was kind and understanding and forgiving. But now when we shift to chapter 19, you know what we see? A warrior king coming with the armies of heaven to conquer the earth, to push out sin, to end the battle once and for all in this place called Armageddon. You know, back in chapter 16, we read that the demons tried to gather all of the non-believers together in this Middle Eastern Valley to march on up to Jerusalem to wage war and to destroy it in this battle called Armageddon, a place called Armageddon. And even though it's in the Bible, we may think, oh, that's just some lofty idea, right? But this is a real place that exists today. And the Valley of Armageddon has actually seen its fair share of battles over the years. 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte fought the Ottomans in this valley. 
In fact, he went on record of saying this was the most natural battleground he had ever fought on in his entire life. That's saying something. In scripture, it's where Gideon defeated the Midianites. It's where Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, gathered his armies to wage war against Hezekiah over and over and over again, all throughout history. In fact, looking even in our history, non-biblical, there's been about 34 different battles that have taken place in this valley where blood has been shed. But there will be one more final battle when the height of hostility and anger towards Israel reaches its pinnacle and they go to war in this valley, that's when Jesus is going to step in and he's going to interrupt this hostility. And he's going to do so with one weapon, just one way. It says the sword of his mouth, the word of God. He's going to come back and see this battle taking place and he just opens his mouth Battle's over. Makes me think of the movie Avengers in Endgame, the the glove of Thanos, right? Once he gets all the infinity stones, he just snaps his fingers, spoiler alert, he just snaps his fingers and it's over. It's done. Same kind of mentality we see here is that Jesus comes back, he sees this war raging, he just opens his mouth and just the, the word that comes out of his mouth, it completely ends the battle for good. And it's over. Wow. Hallelujah. What a great thing that is to think about. What a great thing. I can't wait to be able to be a part of that, to see this from heaven or wherever, just to be able to watch this unfold. Because the other thing we learn is that this one thing, this return of Christ is going to be seen universally. What John sees, what he's writing about in his visions, everyone will see. In fact, we saw this back in Revelation chapter one, verse seven. It said, behold, He is coming in the clouds and every eye shall see him. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, wait a second. How on earth is every eye going to see this at the same time? There's no way that could happen. Well, if this was before 1960, I'd be like, yeah, you're right. That would be very difficult. But since then, we've had satellites, we've had television, we've had social media, we've got the internet. We can see virtually anything anywhere in real time across the world. So this is possible. This is going to happen. Every eye will see it. There's another theory by a man whose name uh, is Erwin Lutzer. And he writes and he says, perhaps the return of Jesus is an event that takes place over a period of 24 to 48 hours where he will appear in the sky and will be seen by all of the world as it turns on its axis. See, folks, the point is still the same. Every eye will see this. Every person on the face of the earth will see this event happening. And because of that, the fourth thing we learn is it's going to result in humility. It's going to result in humility because everybody sees this. There's going to be a lot of emotions on the earth. Some in celebration that Jesus is returning. Some will be mourning because they've misunderstood who Jesus was. And now they get to see him in the full glory. Do you know that there are over 700 different names for Jesus in scripture? 700 different names. It's because he's indescribable. He's called forever. He's called faithful. He's called true. He's king of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's all of these things, right? And he's always been them. And there's going to be this remnant of Jewish people left upon the earth in this time who are going to see this event unfold and some are celebrating and some are mourning because they've misunderstood who Jesus was. They had misread who he was, that this guy they saw before is the same Messiah, the same powerful King of kings and Lord of lords, even in this moment. And they'll mourn. But there will still be a time of rejoicing because the fifth thing is this, is that the return of Christ will usher in tranquility on the earth. It'll usher in a time of tranquility on the earth. Verse 15 says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With it should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with this rod of iron. One day Jesus is going to rule. He's going to come and push aside all political leaders, all military generals and armies and say, let me show you how it's done, boys and girls. (laughs) And he's going to establish his kingdom upon this earth. And he's going to rule 
with this iron rod, which means his justice will be done instantaneously. Do you ever get tired of injustice on the earth? Can't tell you how many times I read through Facebook or social media or I watch the news and I just sit there dumbfounded thinking, this person's getting away with a crime. This should not be happening. There's so much injustice. Why is nobody standing up for this? But those feelings will cease to exist because Jesus will establish his justice. It'll be a justice that covers over all. And it's going to be an amazing time as we see here on the earth. And he's going to come and do this and everybody's going to see it happening and you're going to be like, wow, what a great thing. And when he comes and he ends this battle, he's going to establish this thousand year reign of peace upon the earth. A thousand years of peace. See, we have no hesitation in our lives of who this rider on the white horse is. It's Jesus. It's very clear that it's Jesus. But what's interesting to me is that it's a very different image than how we last saw Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Remember the last time we saw Jesus coming into Jerusalem, he came in riding on a donkey. And now we see here in Revelation, he's coming from the clouds riding on this white horse. Why? Well, it's because kings ride donkeys in times of peace and they ride horses in times of war. And Jesus is coming back to end a war that's taking place upon the earth, to establish his kingdom and to allow this reign of peace for a thousand years. Can you imagine what a world in peace would look like? What that would feel like? In a world where we have unparable, always at peace, where there's no corruption, no injustice, everything is fair. Where dying at the age of 100 is considered dying as a child. <laughs> where there's enough food to go around for every single person on the earth, even though the earth has a lot of inhabitants. Can you imagine what a world like that would look like? You know, for us as believers, we don't have to imagine because it's right here. Because Jesus makes it very clear that this is a reality. This is what's going to happen. This is what all of chapter 20 is about. This a thousand year reign of peace upon the earth. Take a look at this in chapter 20, starting in verse one. He says, and I saw an angel coming down out of heaven having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be set free for a short time. Do you know, six different times we see this number a thousand there's no doubt in our mind how long this period of time of peace will be on the earth. It's going to be a thousand years of peace. But in order for it to happen, a very significant event needs to take place first. Somebody's got to be incarcerated. And that somebody is Satan. That in order for peace to exist on the earth, the one who deceives, the one who brings in sin must be held captive. And so John sees this vision of this angel with a direct command from God to go, to seize, to bind, to capture, to lock up Satan in this bottomless pit. It says he's been given the keys to this bottomless pit. The keys, they represent authority. They represent power, the one who can open and close the door, who guards it. What a great responsibility this is. I can just imagine what this angel must be feeling like all the years just waiting for this moment to happen. It's like an FBI agent getting to capture one of the 10 most wanted criminals and throwing them in prison. It's like, yes, we finally did it. We finally caught the bad guy. And that's exactly what happens. Satan's captured, thrown into the bottomless pit, thrown into imprisonment. And now this thousand years of peace can reign upon the earth. And what happens in this thousand years? Well, chapter 20 goes on to tell us. It says that all of those who had died during the tribulation, all of those throughout the years who have been martyred for their faith will be able to rise up and to be with Jesus in this time of peace where there's no war, 
no famine, no hatred, no injustice, no hurt. It's a time of unparalleled peace that we have never seen before in our history. That's going to be a great thing. Jesus is going to be interacting with people and making sure their desires of their hearts are being fulfilled and they're being met all while not tolerating sin. But then something happens. As we kind of conclude this morning in chapter 20, there's a shift in the story starting in verse 7. Take a look at this. It says, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. <laughs> like the sand on the seashore. See, verse 7 starts with the thousand year period ending. That was quick. Seven verses, and the thousand years are over. But a thousand years are over, and now God has released Satan from his captivity to deceive the world one more time. And maybe you're sitting in this room right now or watching online thinking, why on earth would God release Satan in the middle at the end of this, a thousand year peaceful period on the earth? Everything was finally going right. Everything was finally going well. Why on earth would God release Satan and just start it all over again? It doesn't make sense. Well, I think there are some things on this side of eternity that I'll never understand. But I do know that if I use scripture to interpret scripture, if I let the Bible speak for itself, there's some things that I can defer about what's happening here. And the first one is this. I think that the further and further that mankind gets away from this tribulation, this horrible, chaotic, and grief-filled time, and into this thousand-year period, the more they're going to begin to take for granted the good that Jesus is bringing on the earth. And some will even start to question the goodness of God and rebel. And that's why scripture makes it clear. And it says those who rebel, their number is more than sand in the sea. That sounds like a lot, but you know what folks? That pales in comparison to the number and the army coming from heaven with Jesus to finish this war. And it's a great thing. But we also see a couple characteristics of God being played out here. First is even though we read about his grace and his mercy and his peace and his justice and his forgiving and his second chances in this end time, what we also see is that he's not going to tolerate sin. He has a zero tolerance policy. And anybody who tries to sin or rebel, it's going to be met with swiftly. There's no second chances. There's no mulligans. There's no do-overs. It's an instantaneous justice because he's ruling with the rod of iron. And this is what we see taking place right here, that this final judgment of all those who have died will now be held. And if it's bad, well, you're thrown into the lake of fire with Satan and the beasts and the demons where they belong. And it's this really rough scene on this great white throne of judgment where God is judging all of the world. But he's doing so, so eternity can start that eternity can start without sin. And that's something to rejoice over, that after this moment, it's done. There's no more human history. It's now all about God and living in eternity with him. Free of sin, free of pain, free of sorrow in this scene of heaven that we've seen. But he also tells us one more important thing about Satan as we close. I'm gonna invite the worship team to join me back up here on stage. We learn a couple things about Satan in this moment. The first is this, Satan has been and always will be the enemy of humanity. While God seeks to do good and to help us, Satan's goal is to destroy us. And he's gonna do whatever it takes to get us thrown into that lake of fire. Second thing we learn, Satan's a created being, which means he holds no power over God. And because he holds no power over God, the third and the most important thing that we can think about this morning and we can rejoice and celebrate over is that Satan's fate is certain. It's certain. He's going to be cast in the lake of the fire along with all of those who choose to follow after him. 
See, folks, this is real stuff. This is stuff that we're going to see. This is stuff that we're going to experience. And I pray and I hope that it instills faith and excitement in your life. It's going back to the very beginning, the book of Revelation, it wasn't written to instill fear in us, no, but to inspire, to enhance, to grow, to exemplify our faith. And knowing that if we choose to believe in Jesus, to wait for his return, to experience him in full, man, we get to rejoice in eternity with him, where we get to sing hallelujah for who he is and what he has done. You know, the apostle Paul, just before he died, when he was under arrest, he wrote in Timothy, his final words. And he said, I fought the fight. I've paraphrasing, I've run the race and there now lays for me in heaven a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me in that day. But not only to me, but to all of those who love his appearing. Isn't it interesting that the last thing that Paul has to say to believers is, are you loving? Are you longing for the appearing, for the return of Jesus Christ? Are you waiting for that moment with an eagerness like a child trying to open up gifts on Christmas? It makes me think of my son, Oliver. He is fascinated by planes right now. Whenever a plane goes over, he points up to the sky, goes, oh, and he points like he wants to be up there. He wants to grab a hold of it. He wants to be close to it. Do we have that kind of mentality in our hearts for the return of Jesus? Or we are saying, yes, come. Even so, Father, come. Lord Jesus, come. Be the King of Kings. Be the Lord of Lords. Be the one that we have read about. Be the fulfillment of Scripture we have been waiting for our entire lives. The question is, do you have that in your heart? Is he your King of Kings? Is he your Lord of Lords? Because if he isn't, I invite you to make him that this morning to eagerly wait, to long, to love for the appearing of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we have flown over this text this morning. We've just noted some of the key elements of really what's gonna happen when Jesus, when your son, our savior returns to the earth. Lord, we long for his coming for us, but also for his rule and for his reign here on planet earth. Lord, I pray that we would watch. Father, that we would watch and we would be ready. Pray that we would serve you with a glad heart. And Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't know your son yet. Maybe who only knows him as words on a page. Jesus isn't their king, not their Lord. Father, I pray that would change. Wherever you're seated or if you're watching online or listening to this podcast or message through the radio, wherever it may be, I pray that you just give Jesus your heart right now. Give your life to Christ and change your eternity forever. Speak honestly to him from your heart. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I pray that you'd forgive me. Father, I believe your son came and died for my sins and shed his blood for me and rose again. (laughs) So I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my savior. Help me live for him. Father, we think of the final words of Revelation where John says, even so, come. Lord Jesus, come. Father, we long for your coming. We long for Christ's return. So come, Lord Jesus. This in your name.